Boston Consulting's World Chief, Hans Paul Berker, has come to Australia with a very clear message. Modern companies, whether they're based in the US or Europe or Australia, must be schizophrenic. They must first of all make their base businesses more efficient and review all the things they need to do. But they must go to the emerging markets, whether it be Asia, India, Africa or South America. And in those markets, there is a whole new growth paradigm. Now it's not going to be easy to manage the two processes. And what Hans Paul says is that boards in Australia must become much more diverse in terms of their backgrounds and their racial backgrounds and their emerging country backgrounds. All too many boards um, are, if you like, white Anglo-Saxon. And finally, he tells us, I know that the major companies spend a vast amount of time on governance, ticking the boxes. Well, you're going to have to keep doing that. But you've simply got to make the systems and the time available to get into the emerging markets and go on a growth path. Hans Paul, how do you see the global economy just at the moment? Yeah. Well, actually, long term, I'm very, very optimistic. I think what we should recognize that every 15, 20 years, another billion of people, uh, obviously from the emerging markets and from, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, Middle East, uh, Central East Europe, are uh, entering the global economy as consumers, as workers, as entrepreneurs. And that creates enormous dynamics. So we'll see uh, major growth rates there and, and the world economy really expanding to the east and to the south. Short term, because of the uncertainty, the, the debt uh, issues in North America or in the US, the, uh, the debt uh, crisis in Europe, uh, because of the situation in Japan, um, you know, growth will be modest, quite modest for, for quite a while. Um, but I think the emerging markets will become a, a growing and growing part of the world economy and they will really lift the whole world uh, to a new level over the next several years. How are companies in, in the US and Europe handling their short-term problems? Well, actually, we should recognize that most companies have been very profitable over the last uh, you know, 12, 18 months. They are cash rich. They have huge opportunities. But of course, they are also quite uncertain. They are already uncertain about the second half of 2011, and they would, didn't want, don't want to make any uh, forecasts on 2012. But I think the opportunities, again, are amazing. And I think the key uh, is to understand that, yes, in, in North America, in Europe, in their home markets, Japan, by the way, the same thing, you know, growth rates will be moderate, 2, 3, 4, 5 percent. Um, and you have to, to go for efficiency in, in your home markets. At the same time, when you are, have international ambitions, you need to grow 20, 30, 40, 50 percent per annum in the emerging markets, China, India, Africa, Latin America. Uh, and if you, if you don't do this, you will be marginalized very quickly by the new challenges from those, from those countries. So I think it's, there is, again, an exciting opportunity, but you have to be somewhat schizophrenic about uh, the opportunities. On the one hand, driving for efficiency in the developed markets and going for very high growth in the emerging markets. Well, let's look at those two aspects. Uh, how how are these companies becoming more efficient in, in Europe and Japan and uh, in US? What are they doing? Well, obviously, I mean, there, there are still a lot of legacy assets that they have. You have to look at the whole uh, value added chain, all aspects from R&D over, you know, marketing, sales, uh, production, uh, administration, and, and look how do you optimize this um, uh, value added chain globally. And also, I think, in order to, uh, to make sure that you are not putting all the eggs in one basket, you know, as we see, it's, it's quite dangerous when you do that and depend on, on one factory supplying, uh, you know, certain critical parts for, for a machine or for a car and so forth. Um, but I think really optimizes around the world and make sure that you really um, achieve low cost and at the same time the right quality that you want to, uh, to, to uh, bring to the market. So as part of that process, um, established companies are really re-examining their total operation and, and how they Absolutely. do it. Absolutely. And you really have to, to think of your, also of your business model. 
uh, and to transform and to innovate your business model. Obviously, the, the media industry has to do this in a massive way, but also uh, pharma companies, the telco companies who have to do that. You have to think of you know, the retailers, different formats are becoming more important. And, and the key is not to try to protect the status quo, but to really challenge the business model that you have and to adjust it. You, know, you could be uh, taking parts out, you can outsource, you can also, uh, I think, really move into adjacent uh, industries and sectors. But I think the key is not to stand still. In Australia, we've seen both in retailing and in media, um, companies hanging on uh, to the businesses that they've got and allowing perhaps others to come in and take the new businesses. Well, I, I think there's this famous uh, say, you know, do it to yourself before others do it to you. So, <laughs> and you know, I think there is, of course, a lot of worry about, um, uh, you know, self cannibalization when, you know, I, I go online rather than, you know, go for physical distribution. Obviously, it's a big topic in, in the media industry. Yeah, sure. But ultimately, if you look at um, over time, you need to make this um, uh, transition and you need to make this transition as fast as possible. The same, I think, with, with uh, you know, retailers. When you look at what happened to Borders in the US, uh, one of the, the key um, uh, bookstores mm -hmm. um, and now going bankrupt, I think you need to, you need to uh, move fast in order not to become obsolete. To what extent are companies in Europe, US and Japan doing this? Or are are they, are they embracing this sort of change or are they in fact um, hanging on? Well, I think there are uh, quite a number of great examples where companies really make massive changes and it's painful. You know, you have to uh, close factories or you have to, to uh, even move, um, you know, certain parts of, the, of your business to, to other parts of the world um, or to, to divest certain parts uh, completely. Um, but, you know, I, I'm quite optimistic overall. I think companies recognizing it now there are obstacles, you know, uh, you know, politics in certain countries make it difficult for you to, to change, to, uh, to lay off people. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think the majority of the companies are, are, are trying very hard and I think are doing a reasonable job. Sometimes those changes mean that you have to go to your institutional shareholders and say, our profit is going to fall. That's a hard thing to do. Well, actually, we find that we, we do, uh, for a number of clients, we do uh, talk uh, with the with their shareholders uh, to find out their investors what what's on their mind and actually uh, the large majority of investors actually have um, a medium to long term view have a very good sense of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and and so the idea that you um, that you cannot uh, communicate to your investors or shareholders that uh, the next uh, one two or three quarters will be difficult I think is probably wrong. Um, now, of course, there are also some, some very activist shareholders who mm -hmm. may uh, want to get uh, you know, a quick buck. Uh, but, um, but I think the, the large majority of those uh, of the investors, I think, have a, institutional investors have a medium to long term view. And they, they, they also honor uh, good results and good progress, uh, understanding that you know, sometimes you have to go through, through a more difficult time to transition and you really have to in, in change and innovate the business model. In Australia, um, one of our banks is the ANZ Bank, yep. and they uh, instituted a program to take their business into Asia mm -hmm. and, and put, uh, put the right CEO, all the right things. But they've had great difficulty doing it because the prices of acquiring something in Asia are too high, the governance rules make them frightened. Um, is that the sort of situation we find with Western companies as they try and go into these emerging markets? Well, I think, of course, there is... Um always a worry that um, you overextend yourself and you are going into markets and it doesn't work out. So, you know, there are quite a lot of, um, I would say, banks who have invested heavily in foreign markets and lost a uh, ton of money <laughs> because, you know, they made uh, second or third rate efforts with, you know, uh, not the right quality of people, acquired risk uh, assets, you know, of, uh, you know, which others local uh, banks would not have touched. And so they lost billions. Now, I think if you do this thoughtfully, I think it's the right thing to do. And I would certainly say uh, for Australian companies, Australian banks, Asia is the place to be. Now, of course, not going there you know, in a blind <laughs> way and, uh, and just following the euphoria, but also really making you know, thoughtful investments uh, step by step and expanding. Because for Australia and Australian companies and banks, certainly the future is Asia. And it's not Europe, it's not North America. 
Uh, I, I agree with what, you, what you're saying, but you often find that the management skills that require a company, say, to be efficient in its low growth home market, and then at the same time expand in a growth market like in the emerging countries and Asia, uh, it's a very difficult management task to do the two things together. You're absolutely right. And, and um, uh, I would say really companies have to be in some ways schizophrenic. On the one hand, deal with, with their home markets and the, the drive for efficiency in, the, you know, in a low growth environment. At the same time, you know, uh, go for growth uh, in a high growth environment in the emerging markets. And it really requires to have a, I would say, a much more diverse management than we have had in the past. Uh, not just in Australia, but I would say it's clearly also in, in Europe, in, in, uh, in Japan, uh, in, in North America. And, and, and I, I see you know, companies opening up uh, more and more. I think even in Japan, I was there a few weeks ago, I think more companies are now embracing the idea of having uh, in their top management foreigners, which I would say five years ago was the very rare exception. And when you say foreigners, you're talking about Indians, Chinese, or people from the emerging markets? Well, both from emerging and developed markets. A and to understand that uh, while initially communication in a, in a group which is diverse is difficult, yes. um, I think ultimately you benefit enormously. And I, I would say you know, our uh, executive committee you know, has people from Asia, from, from Europe, from, from the Americas in there. And it makes for a very intense discussion on a number of things. And certainly our colleagues from Asia, um, the region chair from, from uh, India in particular, Jan May uh, Jay Zinha, is, is a very outspoken person, a very passionate person who brings a very different point of view in a number of situations, uh, at times shocking the, the colleagues from, from, uh, from uh, uh, Europe and North America. But I think it's a very important wake-up call. You're saying that um, uh, white Anglo-Saxon boards, and I, that I include Germany and, 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 uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, and their days are numbered, and that you need a, uh, a much more diverse board, particularly with people who know something about emerging markets. Absolutely. I think um, it's a big change for companies. It is it's a very big change. I mean, we talk about companies being global, but when you look at their executive board or supervisory boards, it is still quite a homogeneous group oh, of people. Oh, very much so. Yeah. So, and it's, you know, I'm not uh, criticizing anybody. I'm just describing this. <laughs> and, and I think this change is very important. And I, um, I feel very strongly that everybody should have a, an intense experience of what's going on in Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America. And, and to see this enormous momentum, the aspiration that people have, that companies have. Um, are these I, people around? Are, are these people that can move into top positions around an emerging companies? Oh, yes. Or are they around? Oh, yes. I, I think, of course, you know, you, it's not, I mean, we have billions of people in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. Don't tell me that there's not good talent out there. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I hear those, um, those uh, stories and, and people tend to, to go to the same business schools in North America or Europe or Australia for that matter uh, and, and look for, for top talent. You know, there are great people, you know, from uh, Korean uh, schools, from Chinese, from Indian schools. Uh, but also, I think increasingly we find great talent in, in Middle East Africa, in, in Russia, in, in Latin America. Okay. And I think maybe just we have to look a bit harder, but we have to Just do one it. more point. Um, a lot of major boards that I talk to say that they're spending 70%, and this particularly applies to banks, and I'm not picking a particular yeah. bank out, but 70% of their time is ticking boxes for governance. They only got 30% of their time um, to make the strategic decisions. Um, this, this is a big problem when you're trying to change the direction of a company. Well, of course, it's true that um, I think after the uh, uh, financial crisis, there is a lot of nervousness, and especially uh, regulatory bosses, uh, uh, bodies, uh, governments um, don't want to be uh, caught off guard again. And so they impose a lot more regulations, restrictions, um, uh, oversight, uh, which leads to the ticking of boxes. But I, I think one should not use this as an excuse for not you know, doing the right things. Obviously, you have to put in more systems and also more people to look at risks, to document risks, uh, to have uh, intense communication with the government and regulatory bodies, the central banks and so forth. At the same time, um, I think the, uh, the top decision makers um, 
will have to find the time to look for top talent, for diversify the talent, for looking at the strategic uh, options and, and needs and for making them work. So I think I would not take these excuses. I think you have to move forward and the environment is what it is. And um, I think there are good reasons why the governments try to impose more restrictions. At the same time, um, I think we'll see the pendulum also swinging back once um, you know, we find uh, the risk environment has, um, I would say, um, softened a bit again um, in, in, a, in a positive way, obviously. But for quite a while, whether it's you know, Europe with all the issues on, on the Euro crisis, um, that will be with us uh, and it will um, you know, occupy people's minds. But we should not forget the medium to long term future over the short term, over the short -term uh, challenge that we definitely have. Thank you, Hans Paul. Thank you, Robert.